I take over. Uh, any questions so far? And thank you again, Megan Nicholson and Jasmine. Is Jasmine still with us? Yep, working on it. Questions? Yeah, Kristen. Yeah, thanks for these great talks. Um, I, I had a question for you, Nicholson. So I agree that with the systems uh, you know, uh, analysis. I think we need to look at these on the local level. I think that that's a great approach. And that's the only really approach if we need to, if we want to really look at how these, these tools are, are you know, operating and the impacts on a local level. I wonder if we can just take, and rather than like sort of reinventing the wheel for AI systems, I wonder if we could take some of the insights from implementation science and meta studies where you already have this infrastructure uh, or this approach uh, you know, systemic, a uh, systematic approach for looking at how things are operating and, you know, side by side and identify sort of like the major explanatory features or the major distinctions between AI tool types and then see if we can just sort of like start building a, a kind of repertoire or sort of like catalog of how these tools are, are you know, working on the ground. And yeah, I wonder if you think that that you know, the, those insights from implant implementation science are enough or if we need like a new approach for AI? I'm, so I, I don't know is the short answer. Uh, I am hopeful that those are the, the, those are exactly the types of tools that I'm, I'm thinking of here, right? To the extent that part of what I think about in terms of kind of infrastructure for evaluation and setting up the tools to make this easier is knowing what's important. So, you know, if you've got the bandwidth to ask four questions, it's really important that we know what the four right questions to ask are. And I think implementation science on the question of how do we figure out what are the most important variables here is the right approach to help get us there. Will it be enough? I don't know. Um, Every time I think I have some grasp on just how contingent the health system is, I talk with someone else who blows my mind at how wildly contingent and localized and deeply idiosyncratic the health system is. Like it's, it's bizarre to me that so many places use Epic and yet the system, the data systems that are Epic implemented across different places are just deeply incompatible. Um, I, I didn't, like, years ago I didn't know that was a problem. I just assumed everybody was using the same system so it would be, there would be crosstalk. But that's because I had, I was deeply ignorant. Now I'm slightly less ignorant, but I recognize that the depths of my ignorance about how much idiosyncrasy there is are close to boundless. So I, I don't know the answer. Another question, yeah, Danielle. In the mean meantime, when I am walking, I have a question to Nicholson. Uh, you mentioned uh, the FDA is not uh, regulating a lot of tools. So um, what should we do about this if much of it is not even being seen by regulators? And I think you already mentioned some of those issues and also with local and maybe back to Megan, because local also means community and uh, yeah. I mean, I think FDA has said this is all within our ambit. There's a, you know, the laboratory developed tests exception. They're like, we're going to walk that back. The idea that the stuff in EHRs isn't going to count as AI, or at least nobody that was developing the EHR seemed to think it counted as AI. FDA pushed back hard against that in February or in last September. I don't know. I have a hard time believing that the agency has anywhere near the bandwidth to involve or to actually involve or to actually review these things in a kind of ongoing fashion. I, I have no idea how they're going to do this. If the answer is like, we're going to ramp the heck up out of digital health and we're going to review thousands of products and we are happy to work with our you know, predetermined change control plans and figure this out in a real time enough fashion to be useful, great. I haven't seen indications that the unit's going to hire, you know, hundreds more people in the near future, but if they do, cool. And on your point about local, um, so I think that we need to so think about communities in a less, <laughs> in a less uh, localized and concrete 
context. So when we talk about the communities that are impacted by big health data research, we're not even talking about people whose data necessarily has been used. Like to be, like the Obermeyer case, for example, to have been impacted negatively by that algorithm, your data didn't have to be part of the data set. And so I think we need to release our thinking of saying, you know, well, it's my individual data, or it, I have a stake in this data, by, by our intersectional identities, known and unknown, we have a stake in big health data solving. And, and so therefore, the communities that need to be involved are not necessarily local, physically local, but they are more local in that they have uh, shared uh, contextual identities and that's what localizes them. It's weird to think you might be part of a community that you have no idea you're a part of. That yes. really stretches our boundary of what a community is. Yes, it really, it really does. Yet, I mean, I would, I would argue that probably the largest negative impacts from big health data may be felt by unknown communities. I mean, you know, as we get better at addressing the harms caused to known communities, like, you know, obviously people don't want to do poorly, back to Niels's talk, you know, we can, we can address bias, but as we start to put out the, the fires we know about, we're going to see more of the fires we didn't know about out right. there, right? Um, so sorry to have like snuck in in the middle and to have missed Jasmine's talk, but um, I'm really interested in everything else that I heard, and especially um, my question, which is going to be complicated by your answer, Meg, that you just gave, though mm -hmm. I agree with what you said, um, is you know I'm I'm generally like super excited about and like enthusiastic about this turn toward sort of democracy as the sort of like leading set of values that we're interested in promoting with regard mm -hmm. to AI and so on. Um, but often I'm like try to wonder sort of like what what does that mean exactly? Obviously, it involves an important sense of participation, but we can think about democratic participation looking like a lot of different things. And so I was especially interested in the piece that you described around representation and representativeness. Mm. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more, Meg, about um, what you learned in that first part of the study about how people think about that, especially mm -hmm. given what you were just saying about how like we might be parts of communities we don't even know about, which makes thinking about who and like who gets to represent those communities and how especially fraught, I think, but like super important for thinking about. Yeah. So this, this is like, <laughs> this is one of the really juicy things that came out of our community engagement studios is we had two of our community engagement studios be like, yes, representativeness, like, um, for example, um, uh, one of our groups, our community engagement studio groups, uh, is, was comprised principally of um, people who are native Hawaiian. And they said, well, we have systems for identifying who our representative is. Like we, as a community, know how to do this. And then we had a couple of other communities say, well, how could this person represent my interest? They don't, like, I mean, we share this identity, um, but that identity is only one component of my full identity, and I, I don't trust them to represent who I am. And so this tension between can, can there be a representative for a community, or is having a representative for a community in a, w a way of tokenizing and actually um, dismissing the concerns of the community at large, um, without engaging more deeply and more meaningfully with the community. And so these two things, these two states, are not, from my perspective, things that need to be reconciled, but more realities that we need to be creative in the ways that we address. Because in some contexts, representativeness might be enough, and in other contexts, it may not be sufficient in any way. And so um, it's not a, uh, a binary. I am thinking of it more as a gradient and continuum um, when we think about building these tools to help researchers, IRBs, um, data access committees navigate um, community will in their research. 
Um, I was going to ask, ask a question to Professor McMealy, if, I'm, if I may. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm curious um, if the experience of using trust or trust-like structures in genetic data, so I'm thinking a little bit about UK Biobank, but others, whether there's anything that you think from that experience, either positive or negative, could be learned in thinking about these constructive trusts. So thank you for the question. I hope you can hear me. Um, I definitely think that um, looking at some of the experiences, both positive and negative, need to uh, needs to be a part of um, this consideration of a constructive trust. I think in particular, the genetic um, biobanking, um, but also the other, um, I would say, public-private partnerships that have happened with regard to health systems kind of giving access um, to um, social media or other technology companies, that needs to be studied too as, as a um, precursor or maybe a warning <laughs> um, before we uh, engage in the constructive trust. But I think um, a constructive trust could possibly be a remedy for, I, I'd say, uh, genetic information might be really high level, maybe the most sensitive. Um, taking a step down a level of other health data could be um, um, a way to view it, um, what I'm talking about at least. Um, but I do think that looking at biobanking, the public-private uh, partnerships that um, caused a lot of uproar, and I would say, what was it, like 2018, 2019 with Google and um, the NHS, um, those all are um, very much kind of uh, instances that need to be studied of what could go right and possibly wrong with trust for health and other um, kind of bio, biometric data. Yeah. And uh, I have a question for Dr. Price. Uh, some uh, AI developer might argue that the reason why the system works lo only lo locally is uh, it's not because the approach was reinforcement learning is fraud. It's, it's flawed, sorry. And it's the reason is because the lack of access at a access of data at a universal level. So, do you think it's a better approach to instead of building this uh, evaluation system? And apply it locally across the across different local system. Uh, we should build a universal data sharing sort of like repository, and maybe we can have like open source uh, AI medical system that will work at different level because of the access of data at a universal level. Do you think that's a realistic or better approach? Yeah. So a couple different parts to that answer. Um, I, I am. I always feel awkward saying this when I'm in a room full of bioethicists, but I'm really about lots of data sharing and I'm not deeply concerned about individual consent to data sharing. Um, Same. I mean, honestly. Yay! Yeah. Okay, great. No. This is my room of bioethicists. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, I mean, because individuals aren't likely to suffer individual harm as compared to the harms that they're going to suffer as a member of a community is, is would be my argument. I mean, it's one thing in a clinical trial, right, where it's sure. very individually focused, but in the big data world, like, yeah. you know, you could be doxxed. I mean, no offense, Harvard people, but I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's less likely. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan. So I, infrastructure has become my go-to uh, uh, intervention. And I think one thing that will help with this problem is an infrastructure of and for data. I think about the infrastructure for collecting data across a broad number of additional systems as a helpful tool to help advance us towards this model where we have enough stuff that we run into this problem less. I don't think it's going to go away. I think there are still variables that won't be captured in terms of, you know, what does it look like when you have this type of care environment with these types of underlying beliefs about what's appropriate care versus this type of environment. Like, I don't think that's going to fully go away, but I think it'll help a lot to say, hey, let's capture data from many more types of places than we do now um, by providing infrastructure to get data and then thinking about the data themselves as a form of infrastructure for innovation and development in this space. Like, Beth Real Deaconess is awesome. 
Mimic is great. It is thrilling that we have a data set that has lots of cool stuff that has provided the data for hundreds of machine learning studies and lots of products that are used. It is bonkers that one open source data set has such influence over mm -hmm. what we think are the patterns that are involved in care and how machine learning uses those. That's deeply, deeply bonkers. And we should move as fast as we can to a world where that's not what's going on. Thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, we stop here and I want to thank the panel again. Uh, thank you and we have like a 10, min ten minutes break.